We're the Ivans. Sup? And uh, we, we have no idea how to structure this. We've been struggling for five days. So we're just going to talk at you. We're just going to fight over each other and talk at you, tell you all about the NVGs, break them down, yep. define some tactical ease, what it means. We've done a lot of the research right now. Frankly, there's, there's no good video out there explaining what the hell is going on with a lot of this tactically. Yeah, you could you could spend, you know, three hours on Wikipedia articles and on AR15.com, or you could be nicer to yourself and listen to us ramble. These are the PVF-7. This is the D model. The case for the PVF-7 has remained almost unchanged since, like, 1985 when it was first introduced. Yeah, the PVF-7, it's, it's really just the housing that we've built them in. Yeah. Uh, everything else that you'll hear, all the other buzzwords, it's always talking about the tube the image intensifying tube inside the kit and that's that's the very important part yeah and it is the single most expensive piece to manufacture the the case going around that image intensifier tube it's pretty simple it's some plastic uh it's a little bit of aluminum and it's a bunch of mirrors that's <laughs> it's important but you know it's it's not nowhere near as significant as the tube the right. tube is where all, all the power all the technology really really stands it's also the most important thing to understand if you're going to go and buy a nvg kit because if you don't know the tube you're getting, and if you don't know the terminology, it's really ambiguous, and there are a lot of people who are uh, being very predatory about it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I think the first thing you kind of going to hit whenever you're looking at different tubes is the generation. So you know what constitutes a generation? They weren't just kind of released statically, you know, like the iPhone. There was a series of improvements and different technologies over time and people have kind of put loose brackets around certain milestones and that's kind of what gives it a generation right right most of it has to do with the anatomy of the tube and some very specific pieces in it so we're just going to start from the bottom we're going to start at generation zero late 1920s yeah two yeah. plates and an ir spotlight so what they what they essentially figured out back in the 20s was hey we can see at night if we take a giant infrared spotlight and we pair it with a uh, photocathode, which converts visible light and invisible light into electrons, and then a little phosphor screen on the other side. So what they would do is they would shine the spotlight at somebody, all that IR light would shine back invisibly at night, hit the photocathode, get transferred into electrons, and then hit that phosphor screen. The effort resulted in the familiar sniper scope of World War II. <laughs> But that, that's Gen Zero. That's, that's where we started. Gen One, it basically took the same technology. It improved the photocathode. It improved that phosphor screen. The lenses were improved. But the big, big change is they just stacked a whole bunch together. And you see this in Vietnam. You see this in the Russia-Afghan invasion. What they did is they just took those, those components. same components yeah. and they just stacked them in a row. They lined them up. They're called waterfall, um, waterfall tubes. And the benefit there is that you could intensify the image and all of a sudden you could see further. Image intensifiers amplify available night light. The dim glow of the moon and the stars, even the faint radiation of the polar aurora and the sky glow of the upper atmosphere. At the heart of the system is the image intensification tube, the first generation of which was developed around 1960. The problem, of course, is that with each tube you're amplifying the amount of noise that you get. And if one tube burns out, because they're all linked in a chain, the entire set's done. So despite this advancement, we're still talking about a technology that had a lifetime of like two to 4,000 hours. And, and in a lot of cases, you still needed that infrared spotlight or a big ass flashlight. They were called starlight scopes for a reason, because if there were clouds out, you were kind of screwed. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the mon monsoon season in, in Vietnam didn't really help with all that. No, no, it couldn't have. It couldn't have. So that brings us to Gen 2, and the big thing that happened in Gen 2, you've got the same two plates as before. You've got the photocathode plate and that phosphor screen, but they put something in the middle. They put something very called special a, thing, a very special, highly expensive thing in the middle mm -hmm. called a... Uh, Microchannel plate. There we now, go. That was pretty, pretty solid because instead of having to do the waterfall effect to intensify the image that came through the photocathode plate, this plate would just accelerate all the electrons which would intensify the image on its own and so not only were you getting a much clearer image which would allow you to see more and see farther but also made it a hell of a lot smaller 
Yeah. So it's a lot more portable now, actually usable for weapon optics. So all of a sudden you go from something the size of a two liter or, you know, vehicle mounted options to something that, that fits on a gun. The big problem with this, of course, is that that intensifier portion, that micro channel plate adds a ton of energy into this whole system. And, and we... There's no real term for this. We yeah. call it splashback. It's kind of like if the microchannel plate was a deep fryer and you put your face right up to it, you're going to burn your face over time from splashes, right? Right. Because there's so much energy going on there, and the photocathode is really sensitive to that. So that microchannel plate actually has a, a chemical reaction going on in it, and that chemical reaction throws off ions, which can damage that really sensitive first plate in the series, that photocathode plate. So over time, you still see an effective life that's in that several thousand hour range. So the next kind of technological addition, which then brings us to the bracket of Generation 3, was an ion film which they wrapped around the microchannel plate. So all of those stray electrons couldn't bounce back and reach the photocathode. Yeah, so that was, that was hugely important because all of a sudden the most sensitive component in the entire night vision tube is, is preserved yeah, just for left alone. <laughs> like an order of magnitude longer time. Like we, we go all the, all the way into 10,000 hours. Yeah, easily like three times yeah. the life of the, the yeah. original, uh, Gen 2s. And it's all because you, you have that thin little barrier now sitting between that really sensitive photocathode and that highly energized microchannel plate. That did come with one small con, though. The electrons that came from the photocathode, they did have to still pass through the film. It's kind of like putting your face up to a screen door, yep, yep. but it was well worth the, the lifetime you got out. There's a scattering effect caused by that ion barrier film. So the electrons coming from that photocathode, they get scattered, and despite an advancement in every other component, it still held the technology back because the noise in your picture was a lot more. So that became the target of the next technological improvement, where they went from the regular, what's kind of coined as thick film, to thin film. Yeah. So Gen 3 Plus, there's a few technology changes that we're going to cover, but the most important is what they did with this film. They weren't happy with the scattering effect caused by that thicker ion barrier in between the photocathode and that microchannel plate. So what they did is they made it thinner, and they also improved the barrier or the protective properties of that film. So the end result is you get a, a superior image and also a superior service life. Now you go from the neighborhood of 10,000 hours to 15,000 hours with a better image. Uh, and at the same time, those Gen 3 Plus, those later on Gen 3s, they improve the technology in the micro channel plate too. You can think about those channels as like pixels. They, they added more pixels. So you get a benefit in less noise and a greater possible resolution on that intensifying portion of that micro channel plate. But that's definitely not the only improvement that brought everything from Gen 3 to Gen 3 Plus. There's a right. couple other things, too, including probably another tactical ease word you, term you've probably seen stacked yep. onto the title here, which is autogated pinnacle. And, and that can be really confusing because sometimes people use the words interchangeably. It's a bit like Kleenex and tissue. Uh, pinnacle was one of the first manufacturers to introduce this auto gating. Auto -gating. Yeah. yeah. People use it interchangeably, and really it's, it's not. So the photocathode always has a certain oscillation of voltage you know, turning it on and off. And so what auto gating does is it changes that rate of oscillation at kind of like some form of light sensitivity. So what this means is that in, in brighter situations, it will slow down the photocathode so that it lets less in and it, it kind of adapts. The problem auto gating was attempting to solve was a tube life problem and a, an optics problem because that photocathode, that super sensitive first layer in the tube, it was consistently energized at one state before auto-gating. And the problem with that was if you walked into a bright room or if something blew up in front of you, you would get a, a very overexposed image and it would also damage the plate more than it needed to because that, f that first layer, it's consumable. It degrades over time to create those electrons. So if you looked at a bright light and it was fully energized, you'd be kicking off a ton of electrons that didn't need to be coming off that plate and reducing the overall life. In addition to making a, a very bright image, you know, people would have to pop up their night vision and look away. Yeah. So what autogating did, it was very clever. They decided, okay, we can turn on and off that photocathode plate. We can turn it on and off at a frequency and vary that frequency 
depending on how bright the environment is. So if you were walking into a bright room, it would be off most of the time. And if you walked into a very dark room, it would be on most of the time. And what that did is it normalized the amount of electrons coming off of that plate. So it was constant and all of the components knew what to expect. So that both improved the overall life of the tube, but it also made regulating brightness inside a lot easier because it was always consistent. Yeah, your eyeballs are not going to get nuked. So that, that brings us to a technology that was also put in simultaneously in that micro channel plate. And that's automatic brightness control. And this is very similar to any sort of gain control on your iPhone camera or anything. It's basically auto brightness. And that's an entirely digital thing. And it works in tandem with auto gaining. The only real difference is that that's for projecting the image to your eyes. It doesn't do anything to protect the actual components. The, the very last thing when we're getting into bleeding edge, Gen 3 plus Gen 4, is filmless and, and hybrid uh, night vision. Filmless was billed originally as Gen 4 because there were some resolution improvements, but it's still the same Gen 3 technology. The only thing they did is they took that superior auto gating and that superior brightness control and they said, okay, well, we don't need this film. Because the, these are good enough. These are good enough. So you sacrifice a lot of operating life uh, you're back down into the multiples of a uh, thousand hours instead of you know ten thousand, fifteen thousand plus. Uh, but you know if if you need really really high performance and low light scenarios, it gives you that little extra ten, fifteen percent in resolution and brightness capability without that ion barrier film. Yeah. So for much more urgent situations, right? Mm -hmm. Something the, the absolute maximum performance. You can get something that burns out just a little bit faster because those bit. extra hours aren't going to really matter for, for that kind of necessary yeah. use. It's like putting an afterburner on your night vision <laughs> tube, right? Like it's useful, but only really in emergencies. So uh, some manufacturers, they because it had a performance increase, they tried to make that Generation 4. Everybody's kind of walked back from that now. What's called Generation 4 now are usually hybrid devices or pure digital devices. Hybrid being they combine this traditional technology with a thermal imaging overlay and digital where they just have a really nice ISO like camera CMOS sensor mm -hmm. and they have great low light performance. Yeah, so that's not really even using a tube at that point. It's just, no. like, it's just like a DLSR camera that's really good. Yeah. Of course, the benefit of traditional night vision is power consumption. Those thermal displays and those camera displays, those eat up battery like nobody's business, whereas you can get 40 hours plus Yeah, 40 to life. 60, depending on the batteries you use in yeah. these guys. And, and that's that's crazy for just, you know, two little batteries. Two, like, two double A's, like <laughs> nothing special. And then the bag that comes with these has like a bunch of different little storage compartments just for like holding a handful of batteries. You can pack up for, you know, 200 hours. And it's not really a thought at that point. So now that we've been through most of the features and the different versions of night vision, there's a couple more things to look out for when you're actually in the market for buying a pair. One more rating system you might run into is the Omni system. The Omni system is the precise version of generations. Uh, the military needs really accurate standards of how to build the tubes when they make contracts for manufacturers, and the Omni system is the actual standardization of that. So our tubes are Omni 7. Omni 8 is still kind of in in production, they're still developing it. That covers some of the fancy hybrid Gen 4 night vision that we talked about. Another thing to look out for is damage to your tubes. If you can get an actual picture of the image through your tube, you're going to want to see that if possible because it's really easy to permanently damage a tube just by using a, a green or red laser or a non night vision compatible red dot sight. And that's honestly really common among airsofters and things like that. It, oftentimes people will get a really nice high quality tube and then they'll go outside and they'll want to pretend that they're special forces and they'll take their green laser pointer and they'll stick it somewhere and then there'll be a permanent after image etched into the tube because that, that green laser can't be regulated out with auto gating. Another bit of information you'll want to get if you can is how old your tube is and how much it's been used. Um, a lot of tubes on eBay they could have been used in the field for thousands of hours and it's really old and at the end of its lifespan so if you can get any semblance or any rating of how old your tube is that also helps you kind of evaluate you know if it's worth the purchase another thing to look at is the build quality so the housing for the tube is it used is it new and how was it actually assembled anyone can go on YouTube and look up how to install a tube into a kit 
And a problem with that kind of installation is cleanliness, and a lot of guys miss certain things like nitrogen purging. Nitrogen purging removes all of the air out from the inside of the kit around the tube, so when you change altitude or temperature, you don't get any condensation, and that's pretty important for the longevity of your device and also just the clarity of your image. Luckily for us, all of our kits were built and uh, the tubes were tested by Nificis, so they individually tested and rated each of our tubes for defects and the lifespan. It came out pretty optimistic because all of our surplus tubes are just from training kits, so they weren't used for very long. They also nitrogen purged and assembled all the kits in a clean room, so they're perfect manufacturer refurbished essentially. And because of that, we're putting a one-year warranty on both the image intensifying tube and the kit. So if something's wrong with your tube within a year, we have tubes placed aside and Nivisys will reinstall a replacement tube in your kit. Same thing goes for the kit. If your kit breaks in some way, Nivisys will transplant your tube into a new kit. So I think that about covers up all of the general bases. Uh, if you have any other questions or we got something wrong, just spam our live chat. There's a little blue button on our website, and you can annoy all of our customer support workers. Yeah, commandostore.com.